We often describe Iris as being language independent. The mechanism behind this is that Iris allows you to instantiate it with your own language. In this video, I'll explain what that means and how it works in general for any programming language that manipulates a heap. As with any language, we'll start by defining the syntax. The language interface expects a type, both for expressions and a separate type for values, with functions to go back and forth. Not all expressions are values, so the toVal function is partial. And this projection also determines which expressions are values, which is going to be important later on for determining when programs are stuck versus have terminated. As a running example, we'll consider a standard lambda calculus with expressions that include variables, applications, and lambdas, as well as other various other heap-specific and concurrency-specific operations. The lambda construct in this language is slightly unusual in that it gives a name to the current function to natively support recursion. In addition, in most Blackboard presentations, values would just be a subset of expressions, but the language interface requires them to be a separate type. So there's a difference between an expression lambda and a value lambda when we define this in Coq. Next, of course, we need a semantics for the language. Because this is a stateful language, we'll define a type of state. In this case, it'll be just a basic heap. And then we need to define a transition semantics. The transitions will be between starting expression and state sigma, and then they'll sort of output a new expression, a new state, as well as a list of spawned threads to support fork. Next, we need to actually define this transition semantics. The way we do that matches the way we do it on a Blackboard, namely by giving some evaluation contexts and then some rules for each specific construct in the language. Here, I'll just give a quick example of evaluation context items with the two evaluation contexts related to applications. The, first, the one on the left says that whenever we have e and then some, some sub-expression, we can evaluate the right-hand side. And then the other evaluation context says we can only evaluate the function in an application after fully evaluating the right-hand side down to a value. So the combination of these two evaluation contexts is what means that this language has a right-to-left evaluation order. After we've defined all the context reductions, we also need to define the head reduction rules that specify how to reduce each construct in the language. So here, for example, I've given the rule for stores, which explains how a store modifies the heap. It's worth mentioning here that Iris has a lower level language interface where the user simply directly gives the transition relation on the left. What I've shown here uses the eContextI language feature of Iris, which handles all the work of going from contexts to a full transition semantics. The most interesting part of instantiating Iris is getting weakest preconditions to work. There's one more ingredient we need before we can use the generic definition of weakest preconditions in Iris, which is the state interpretation. So recall that we defined our own notion of state for the language, so it makes sense that we need some way to connect this state to weakest preconditions. The way that works is with the state interpretation function which takes a state in the language and maps it into some ghost state in Iris that represents intuitively owning the entire state of the language. The way that I'm going to explain the state interpretation is by showing how it appears in the definition of Hor triples. And I'm not going to show the generic definition of Hor triples. I'm just going to show what that definition boils down to for a specific example, namely for this Hor triple for store. And that way it'll be a little bit more concrete and maybe easier to see what the definition of WP really looks like. So here's that definition. Let me start breaking that down in a couple steps. So the first thing is we can observe that at a very high level, this definition assumes that we have the precondition as well as the state interpretation for some arbitrary state sigma. And by the end of it, we have the state interpretation for some sigma prime, which will be intuitively after running store, and the post condition. Now I'll go over what's inside this definition in, the, in between. The first thing that we have to prove when proving this Hor triple is that store is reducible in any state where the state interpretation holds and we have the precondition resources. We can do that because this L maps to V0 is going to guarantee that L is actually mapped in the heap, and therefore we're able to execute the store. So this, this takes care of proving that store is not stuck if this precondition holds. The next thing we need to do 
is prove something under the assumption that store has executed. So this corresponds to partial correctness. We get to assume that store has actually run to a value. What we prove is that if store executes, and recall that there is at least one execution, now we're going to prove something about all of those executions, then the state interpretation holds in the new state, and the new state has the post condition resources, and also the value that store reduced to actually satisfies the post condition, um, which in this case just says that the return value is unit. There's one thing I glossed over, which is this so-called fancy update modality. The fancy update modality says that while we're proving this weakest precondition, we're also allowed to update any go state before proving that the state interpretation holds. Um, and this is necessary because we actually need to update the go state to match the transition that store made. And that's also what's going to take the L points to V0 fact and actually transform it into L maps to V. I want to take a step back and notice that we assume this pre the state interpretation holds at the beginning, and then we prove that it holds afterward. The reason why this is sufficient is because store is atomic. Um, if store were not atomic, then this would not be sufficient. We need to prove that the state interpretation holds at all intermediate steps of the program. That's what makes it so that any other thread, uh, any other thread's weakest precondition can rely on the state interpretation holding when the expression starts evaluating. To give you a better intuition for how the state interpretation works, I'll show a simple example of the state interpretation for just the heap. Both the state interpretation and maps to definitions are just ownership of a particular ghost variable. So to understand these definitions, what I'll do is I'll leave these definitions on the slide while I explain what that resource algebra is. The RA used to define the state interpretation as well as the maps to has two types of elements. It has authoritative elements and fragments. Both of these take a map argument, um, and we can also compose the auth and the fragment together. Auth elements never compose, so there's a single authoritative element uh, which is going to live inside the state interpretation. In this context, you can kind of think of the state interpretation as being like an invariant maintained by the weakest precondition throughout program execution. The fragments, on the other hand, are going to be owned by threads. Um, and while auth elements don't compose, fragments do. So two map fragments compose into their union if the maps are disjoint, and otherwise uh, the composition returns some bottom element which is invalid. Turning our attention back to the definition of maps2, now we can understand what this means. Um, so at last we can give meaning to the maps2 uh, connective of separation logic. What it asserts is fragmentary ownership of a singleton map that maps just L to V. The reason why this definition is interesting is because of the validity definition for the resource algebra. What it says is that when we compose the authoritative and the fragmentary elements, all of the fragments composed together must agree with the authoritative element. And since we hand out these maps to resources that are fragmentary ownership, that means that any thread that has L maps to V knows that the state actually maps L to V. At this point, I want to go back and explain a subtlety in this two, these two definitions related to the name of the ghost variable that we're using for both of these ownerships. This gamma heap is going to be an implicit argument which we establish at the beginning of the proof and then we maintain throughout the rest of the proof. This is mostly relevant to the Koch implementation where in Koch, gamma heap doesn't have to be passed around everywhere, it gets implicitly passed through sigma. And then the way that it's established initially is that there's an adequacy theorem for the entire language which creates it at the very beginning before running any programs. Let's turn our attention back to proving a primitive whore triple, in this case just for store, uh, using this new state interpretation that we've written down, as well as the definition of maps too. So if we take away all the stuff about reasoning about store's execution semantics, what we're left to prove is this view shift. This view shift has two components in it. One comes from the state interpretation, which recall is just ownership of the authoritative uh, element of the RA. Um, and the other component comes from the precondition, which is ownership of this singleton uh, fragment uh, within the same ghost resource. So what we need to do is we need to make a view shift 
from the combination of the state interpretation and this element to a new state interpretation with an updated heap. And in the process, we want to get out a new fragment. Due to the design of this resource algebra, this is a frame preserving update of the heap array, and so we can directly construct this view shift. Intuitively, the reason why this view shift holds, or why this frame preserving update holds, is because the frame can, can't have another element that maps L to any other value, because that combination is invalid. Um, and therefore, as long as we have both the authoritative and the fragment, uh, and a fragment corresponding to L, we can update the value at L to anything else. To summarize what we've seen so far, what you need to do to instantiate Iris for a custom programming language is first, you need to define a syntax for your language in terms of its expressions and values. Second, you have to give your language a semantics. The semantics first needs some type of state. For example, it would typically have something to model the heap. Then, we typically want to define the semantics in terms of some context rules that determine how to execute sub-expressions, and then give a handful of head reduction rules that give the semantics of the atomic primitives. Iris gives us an e-context i language interface, which takes those pieces and forms a full language semantics from them. Next, to use the Iris program logic and its definition of weakest preconditions, we have to give a state interpretation that maps our language's states into some form of Iris Go state. We saw a typical example of this, where the state interpretation is some authoritative ownership and individual threads own fragments of the same ghost variables as the authoritative ownership. Finally, the core language primitives, such as the atomic heap operations, we have to give some manual proofs for their specifications. Those manual proofs are in terms of the definition of weakest preconditions directly. And these proofs directly interact with the state interpretation and update it with view shifts as the state evolves. So hopefully this tutorial helped explain how Iris is parametric in the language and what that even means. To accompany this high-level conceptual overview, I also wrote a code-focused tutorial that goes through this whole process in Coq for a simplification of heaplang, which you can find at this URL. It has profile comments that walk through these same steps in a more cock focused way, showing you the Iris implementation. To actually make this language somewhat usable, the code also defines some nice notations and tactics so that we can prove example programs correct written inside this language. The code is a nice accompaniment to this tutorial because Cock really forces us to pin down all the details. So if you're interested in really understanding everything that's going on, I encourage you to check that out.